Avram, Sarah, Elon. When did you first start thinking about these incidents? When I was released. Only afterward, some time afterward. When did it come up? All of a sudden, picture. This powerful image I get whenever people talk about what they did in the army. You don't deal with things in the army. You don't talk about it. Every time there's some kind of breach, ethical breach, someone closes their eyes. How about you, Alon? I have images in my head, but I don't remember details. I really repressed that period. It's not like I suffered there that I'm traumatized, but I finished the army and started a totally different life. It never happened. Forget it. It goes no further. I'm telling you the most banal things. I know what you're talking about, but you have to remind me. In Elkanah, the settlement in the West Bank, there was a fence that separated the Jewish settlement from the nearby Palestinian houses, so the army set up a checkpoint there. It's that guy again, over there. Where? There, back of the building. Stop! Step away, turn around! Arms up! Arms up! I told you, you have to have a permit. I can't get one. We've been through this. When? One hour ago, when you were here before? That must have been my twin brother. This is for you and your twin brother. I just have to get to work. I have 10 people in my family. I am the only one not in prison thanks to you guys. Shut up. Get down. Get down! Down! On the ground, now! On your stomach! Why are you crossing here? You don't cross here anymore, get it? Let him go. Get up. Get up! Hurry up! There were rules for who could cross at a checkpoint. It's forbidden to cross if they don't have this document or that permit, a work permit. Stand here. He stood there four or five hours like that. Were there other incidents like that similar? All kinds, yes. Anyone gets rude. Raise his voice, just got on our nerves. We tie them up, make them kneel, dry them out. For how long? It could be eight or nine hours, until we got tired of it. Then when we changed guards, we, we'd instruct the staff replacing us to leave them there for at least another two hours. Stuff like that. Why did you do this? Because at some point, they turned into such worms. I hated them. Worms. So angry at them for their filth, their misery. The whole fucking situation. Why couldn't he get a permit? We once asked a shin bed agent about the criteria. We were told there's a very clear d definition. If any family member fourth degree down, has ever been charged with an act of violence against Israel? No work permit. That's one of the criteria. Now show me someone. I mean, what's the percentage of the population? Nothing. It's zero. We've been at war with them for over 50 years. So clearly someone somewhere threw a rock at some point. You see? Everything is documented. So, you get a young man who comes in for a work permit, and the grandfather or the father of his brother threw a Molotov cocktail in 1962. So he can't get a work permit. So what does he do? He bypasses the checkpoint. And why would he do this? To carry out a terrorist attack? No, to 
to work. It didn't sit right with me, drying him out for five hours. Well, did you talk about it afterward, about whether it was okay or not? We really didn't talk about things like that. What happens, happens. Tell me about the checkpoints. There are 60 checkpoints in the West Bank. More. There are also hundreds of flying checkpoints. What's called a check post or an unestablished checkpoint, which is set up with an armored personnel carrier so you can close off a wide area and prevent Palestinians from exiting there. Why? I remember being told quite clearly, our mission is to disrupt. These were the exact words. Disrupt and harass people's lives. Mostly to protect the settlements. When they'll be able to evacuate the settlements in general, it'll be possible to get rid of many of the checkpoints. Evacuate? But a certain number will still exist between the Palestinian cities. There was a checkpoint for the people of Deir Balut, a Palestinian village, for whenever they would travel out of the village. And the inspection itself, if you stop and think about it, is pointless since they can only go to neighboring Palestinian villages. There's no Jewish traffic on that road, and there really isn't any access from it. So it shows you that they just put a checkpoint there for no reason, every day. And then there are the border crossings between the West Bank and Israel. 40 more checkpoints. Right. Palestinians cross into Israel mainly to work. The AL crossing was built with different traffic lanes, a Jewish lane, a Palestinian lane, and a lane for trucks. And you knew which cars were Jewish or Palestinian? Because of the license plates. They're different colors. There are Jewish-only roads all over the West Bank. Bypass roads? They connect the settlements. Arabs need a permit to use them, and good luck getting that. The whole AL border cross, the, the checkpoints overall, the guidelines are equivocal. Sometimes they close it right at the last second, and you don't know what to say to the Palestinians there. The Ephraim Gate on the border was in Tulkara, and 107 was in Kalkilia. And both were pedestrian terminals. At peak times, the number of Palestinians there would be around 3,000. Hmm. Were you ever in a situation where there were 3,000 people at an entrance and you told everyone to go home? Yes. I yelled at them to go home when the checkpoints closed. Not every month, but a few times a year. Go home! Go! It's closed! What, what do you mean, it's closed? We've been waiting here for three hours. It's closed! Go! I have a job to get to. Get to my job. Get through this. Like, We've been no, waiting here for three hours. No, every single time, you always got to say something different. The bullshit excuses and everything. Can only get it. The whole thing with the Jewish roads was a pretty upsetting experience. Most people don't know about them. They say, "Don't worry about it. There are side roads. The Palestinians can drive through the villages." But instead of taking 20 minutes to get somewhere, it takes at least an hour. Let me tell you about the first checkpoint in my life. It was in the city of Hebron. There are 17 checkpoints just to protect the settlement in the middle of the city. At first they tell the you- Arabs only cross with permission from civil administration. Okay, you're there. Here comes the first person. Have you got permission from the civil administration? No. Then what have you got? Student ID. Wait. In principle, he's not allowed through. But so what, let's ask. You get on the radio, you ask the guy sitting in the company operations room. Who's in the company operations room? The company clerk. Listen, someone with a student ID, do they go through or not? I don't know. I'll call the brigade operations room. They must know. Who's in the brigade operations room? The operations sergeant. Does the operations sergeant know? I don't know, I'll ask the operations officer. Hey, can someone with a student ID go through or not? The operations officer doesn't know, but because he's the operations officer, he can't let on that he doesn't know. Yes, someone with a student ID can pass. 
Yes, someone with a student ID can pass. That's just a soldier or settler beating up an Arab. You can't do anything about it. Around Hebron, that's normal. Okay, fine. Have you got permission from the civil administration? No, but I have a teacher's license. Wait. If you let someone through with a student ID, shouldn't you be able to go with a teacher's license? But I don't know, so... Can I let someone through with a teacher's license? I don't know. Can they let someone through with a teacher's license? I don't know. Can they let someone through with a teacher's license? Okay, if you let someone through with a student ID, then someone with a teacher's license can pass. I got it. If they let someone through with a student ID... I'm late. You know, you can put your gun away. It, it's just one of your buddies firing tear gas grenades at the kids on their way to school. Around Hebron, it's normal. I don't have it. One of your guys took it about five hours ago. Why? I guess he didn't like the way I looked at him. I don't know. I've got a man here who says they took his ID five hours ago. Yeah? Well, what do I tell him? Tell him to get a new one. They didn't need to take his ID. He can't do all kinds of things until he gets a new one, and that could take a long time. I'm sorry I can't let you through without an ID. You're new here, aren't you? Let me tell you something. A soldier takes one of our IDs five, ten hours, maybe even overnight in Hebron. That's, That's normal. normal. I want to know about Gaza, the blockade. I'll give you an idea. So Israel's sea border on the Mediterranean is 12 miles out. It limits Gaza to only three to six. It changes all the time. Fishermen can only go three miles out. Now, there are kids that get up early every morning, as young as four or Most six. Most of the fish are 12 miles out. How are the fishermen supposed to make a living? There's a naval blockade to prevent weapons from coming by sea. So the kids go fish in the off-limits areas early every morning because there are no fish there, so the fish swim up there. Now, every morning, we'd shoot in their direction to scare them off. It got to the point of shooting towards kids' feet on the beaches or, or shooting at those that were headed in that direction on a surfboard. What does that mean, shoot in their direction? Well, it starts with shooting in the air, and then it shifts to shooting close by, and then in extreme cases, shooting towards their legs. I never shot at anyone's legs, but there were others in my company who did. What distance did you shoot from? Far. Five, six hundred meters. You shoot with a Raphael heavy machine gun, it's all automatic. Where do you aim? Well, it's about perspective. So in the camera, there's a measure for height and width. And you mark on the cursor where you want the bullet to go. It cancels out the effect of the waves and hits where it's supposed to. Hits where it's supposed to. Where do you aim? Like five or six meters away. There were cases where they hit the surfboard, but I didn't see it. You know, there were other things that bothered me. The Palestinian fishing nets. The fishing nets? Yeah. Their nets cost 4,000 shekels, which is like a million dollars to us. When they disobeyed us too many times, we'd sink the nets. Why? As a punishment. For what? Because they disobeyed us too many times. A Palestinian fishing boat drifts into an area that's off limits. A Navy patrol comes, circles, shoots in the air. They go back. An hour later, the boat comes back. So does the patrol. A third time, the patrol starts to shoot at the nets, at the boat, and then shoots to sink them. This is so the weapons don't come by sea.
and the checkpoint at Gaza's borders. One of our outposts was near the Erez crossing between Israel and the Gaza Strip. So a lot of Palestinians would go through it to get to work in Israel. They'd cross it every morning and come back in the afternoon. The thing is that every day they come back with lots of things they bought in Israel. Because things are a lot cheaper in Israel. Yes. The Erez Battalion manned the checkpoint. And it was the most active checkpoint in the mm, Gaza Strip in terms of the amount of people crossing there. Apparently, one day. You're not allowed to bring anything in. What? Why? Someone tried to smuggle out something this morning. What has that got to do with us? Orders. Someone smuggles something, a weapon out oh, But we're coming back in. Uh, you think we got a rocket in Israel somewhere? Look, we just bought furniture and lots of clothes for the family. You want to check it? Yeah. No, I'm not going to check it. You can't bring anything in. This is stupid. What are we supposed to do with it, huh? This costs a lot of money. I can't believe this. This is a month's wage, if not more. Look, you know us. You see us every day. Them. Sorry, these are my orders. Here, I have some cigarettes. Come on, what do you want? I can't. They're clothes for our, our children. A chair for his mother. You can't bring anything in. Are you serious? We'll just stay here however long it takes. How long, huh? How long do we have to stand here hoping that he's going to change his mind? It won't happen. You never know. Sometimes they get another order and everything changes in a minute. Almost everyone in this line has something that they bought today. Are you going to tell them all the same thing? Yes. No, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, what are you going to do with all of our stuff? Just destroy this it? This is bullshit. They're screwing with us for fun. That's what this is. is. I'm, I'm not going to check in. Come on, this isn't right. It doesn't matter. This isn't right. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. I have orders. Hey! hey! Back up! Back! Back! Put that away. Put it away! I said put it away! You're very vulnerable at a checkpoint. You're a soldier. You're standing there and it's easy to attack you. A person who gives you some trouble, who, who disturbed the peace at the checkpoint, who spoke to you in a certain way. You have to keep your authority. You have to keep it so that they respect you. That's the reality of the checkpoint. They had to eat all the food because they couldn't bring it in and put on all the shirts and clothes? Seven, eight layers. Because they were allowed to go in with whatever they had on, but not with bags of clothing. When did this happen? Before the last mm, Gaza war. <sighs> now, no one goes in or out of Gaza. The siege is complete maybe two trucks out a day. <laughs> you know what they say? When Israelis do a siege, an ant can't get in. What was it like inside Gaza? In one of the houses in the northern Gaza Strip, someone found a beret and an armband from 417. Arafat's guard. I took them. Just like lots of guys took souvenirs from houses that were about to be demolished. Another time, I accidentally broke a small pipe on a water tank and all the water leaked to the ground. It sounds insignificant with the destruction all around, but with one movement... You denied that family water for a month. There's an enormous dissonance between living in a middle-class community in Israel and being in Gaza in an environment of poverty. No sewage system, no l living conditions. Very, very tough areas. And you can tell that their situation used to be much better. But now, it's simply massive destruction. I was there, and we blew up houses and tunnels. Lots of destruction all over. Being inside a tunnel is a very powerful experience, and then you think, what makes people dig a tunnel? It was very intense for me when I realized that it's actually an act of despair. Wherever tunnels are dug, people are desperate. Hmm. Well, we could talk about Gaza forever. Were any of you stationed near the wall? A separation barrier. It's for Israel's security. Separation wall, separation fence, apartheid wall, security wall, security It is fence. for Israel's security. Well, not exactly. 
What do you mean? Well, it goes around the settlement, taking over a lot more of the Palestinians' land. It's an annexation wall. <laughs> I'll give you an example. We were in Calkelia, exactly at the point where they dug the fence, the wall. There were residents there whose fig and olive groves we were uprooting. It was really difficult for me to see. Are you a farmer? No, but you know someone comes and says, your, your home is mine now, your land is now mine. Everything you've invested in for 30 years. You know, older people, farmers, people for whom this tree is food. Do you remember meeting with these people? whose trees you uprooted. Yeah, you meet them. I remember one incident. It gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Stop! Whoa. Hey! Stop! <coughs> Stop them! Those trees are 200 years old. I've tended them day and night for 30 years. And now you're killing them! Uh, there's nothing you can do! Please, can't you talk to them? I worked for 30 years. This is my life, do you understand? What is my family to do? My trees. <laughs> my trees. <laughs> <laughs> Each time, it's just one person's land. You're not harming a place full of people. Each time, you're just seeing a single person, and then he has no power. He can only lie on the ground and cry. The idiocy of this country, they, they took this guy's land, and tomorrow they'll decide, after they've already destroyed it, that the fence doesn't work there. They'll decide to cancel it or go around. Hey, come on, get up. Hey. You don't care. You don't care. What does your father do, huh? Would you take away his living like this? In two minutes? What's the wall for? It surrounds the settlements. They decide whether the security fence should go around a settlement or not. Our mission is to disrupt and harass people's lives. That was our job description. Disrupt the lives of the people who live there because this disrupts terrorist activity. How does that work? We conduct random house searches. It's not like we had any intelligence in advance. Soldiers would come in, turn the house inside out, make a huge mess, and leave. That's what we do. In Tulkarum, the order was made for all the men to go to a giant soccer field. So then there'd be no men left in the city. So it'd be easier to conduct the searches. Get it? No. The men stayed there for some 48 hours. It was a pretty serious media storm. Concentration camps, you know, blah, blah, blah. In any case, we go in. You know, in the beginning, it's like you're on a high. You can really feel the fear. Stop it! I want to draw! Those are mine! No, they're not! Aisha, I need to do your hair. Stop. Come on. Dana, no. you're not going out. Well, there's nothing to do here. Well, have you finished your homework? Yes. So. Oh. Why are there soldiers everywhere? Soldiers? I don't know. I hate well, I think they're cool. What are you talking about? Come here. Show me your picture. <laughs> What's that there? That's... <laughs> Mama? One clear! Mama? Two clear! No, All clear! No, Corner no, now! No, Corner! No, no, Corner! No, no, Corner! Get down! No, no, no. Clear! You already took him! Now what do you want? There's nothing here that you want! Avram! What? That's Zena, the girl at the checkpoint. So? We talk to her every day. What the fuck? It's clear to me we won't find anything. But never mind. I'm telling you, we turn the house upside down like a hurricane's been there. 
There was no sense of doing a search? Well, there was some sense of doing a search. But at the same time, there's also vandalism. We smash the floors, turn over sofas, throw plants and pictures, turn over beds, smash the tiles. We were there at least three hours. I remember when I went home for the weekend. On the radio, they said there were operations in Tulkarm, and the IDF seized like 20 suspects, 10 weapons, and fertilizer suspected for use in explosives manufacturing. A ton and a half of fertilizer. And I remember saying, what bullshit? I mean, who even knows if fertilizer was there? And my father. What about your father? Look, he, he has moderate opinions. But he says to me, oh, come on, you think it was ordinary fertilizer? And I said back to him, who even knows if that was there? And he just says, oh, come on. You know, I suppose if I was sitting at home and didn't know what was going on, I might just say, Come on. But after everything that I saw, and it was just... So it's a success because you hear it on the radio. And you say, look, like, like we went there, this is what we got. We, we did what we were supposed to do. What we did was just the opposite. We committed crimes. We destroyed homes. No house we went into was the same when we left. Now, this was the first time that I understood that everything that I was told was complete bullshit. From then on, I didn't stop doing the things I did. I just stopped thinking. There was one house in Jarez that they just demolished. They have a dog that can find weapons, but they didn't bring him. They just destroyed the house. Things from these operations are always surfacing in my mind. Like what? Elon? What we should really talk about are the settlers. Ugh. How did you relate to them? I get in arguments with the settlers. I'd always talk with them. I said, bottom line, you guys are criminals. You're breaking the law. It's illegal for you to even be here. <laughs> Israel wants them to be here. They're settling the West Bank for Israel. Right. <laughs> Different fingers on the same hand. You know, the settlers told me, we stretch the law. The law will bend according to what we do. What does that mean, we stretch the law? You have no idea. In the South Hebron Hills, we all had to go out on patrol at the settlement Beit Hogai. The situation there is that your commander is actually the settlement security coordinator. He gives you authorization to shoot in the air. He fixes policy. It's pretty ludicrous when you think about it. When a civilian tells the army what its limitations are, what the laws are, the settlement security coordinator would come and define the precise border of the settlement. Here, you see this place, this line? That's the settlement's territory, and that area over there. It was open farming area, and there was no fence around the settlement. They're prohibited. 
The Arabs can't go there. They sometimes come with their tractors to work the land, but they're not allowed. It's not their land. Okay, I get it. One day he comes to me and says, Get over here. They're coming to work the land. Fire a few shots in the air to scare them. Uh, these guys will give you trouble. Hey, you could hit them. Come here. The settlers started going down to the farmers, the, the Arabs. They grabbed them. They slapped and kicked them. Tell him. This is not the settlement's land. Go ahead. You can't be here. You can't. Who says we can't be here? <laughs> this is our land. My grandfather and his grandfather worked it. <laughs> the settlement just keeps getting bigger and bigger, taking everything away from us. And now, they're coming down and burning our olive trees. They are killing our sheep. You're in Judea and Samaria, pig. <clears throat> when you go near the settlement, you can smell the blood. Don't come back here. This is the only way they'll learn. This is the only way they won't trespass next time. That's what happened at Beit Hogai. You didn't think to yourself that maybe this is the Arab's land? Honestly, I didn't think about that. I didn't doubt it when the settlement security coordinator told me it was his land. Did the Palestinians present a threat? No, I didn't feel they did. You know that's the settlement's area, so they shouldn't go there. In the territories, every Palestinian is a potential terrorist. There's some kind of boundary that begins at the settlement, and I don't know if it's legal or not or how it's defined, but if the Palestinians are allowed to walk freely near the settlement, it makes it much more difficult to protect. So they have to keep a certain distance. The policy of silent transfer. What? You've never heard of it. The policy of silent transfer. Hebron is a small, isolated world. And the Avraham of Venus settlement is isolated inside of Hebron. More soldiers guard it than people living there. I was on guard duty outside the settlement, and a soldier at another base called for a medic over the radio. A Palestinian girl had been wounded. My God! Oh, she's gonna need stitches. What happened? The settler girl threw a brick at her. What? Do I know you? I'm Dalit. We were security detail on our shopping trip last week. What is wrong with you? She's not supposed to be here. What? what are you talking about? Arabs can't walk this street. She's five years old. What's going on here? Papa, they're hurting me. Your daughter just threw a brick at this little girl. This has nothing to do with you. Come on, darling. Now he's gonna go praise her. It's because of these shits that we're here. Come on, let's get her out of here before it gets worse. This is what causes the whole mess. These little fights that the settlers start. I know their parents teach them to hate the Arabs. And so they legitimize throwing rocks and cursing them. So you'll know there'll be a mess afterwards. And you don't understand which side you're on. I am a Jewish Israeli soldier, and I'm supposed to be against the Arabs because they're my enemy. But I'm here, next to a settler's house at the base, and I start thinking that I am not on the Jew side. They're not right. 
I have to flip a switch in my brain so that I can keep hating the Arabs and justifying what the Jews do. But I still can't agree with the Jews because they started it. It's because of the settlers that were here. There are many cases like this. 11, 12-year-old settler kids beat up the Palestinians and their parents come along to help them. They even set their dogs on them. There's a thousand and one stories. There's one operation in Hawara that's etched in my memory. Hawara, isn't that the Arab village that has been the target of price tag attacks? Right. Just random acts of violence by the settlers. Revenge for whatever. You have to understand, Hawara is stuck between four settlements. The settlers had decided they were going to attack the residents of Hawara. And we were supposed to protect the settlers while they were throwing stones. Going on a rampage. Get out of I don't fear you, I only fear God. Illegal. Arabs to the crematoria. What were the Arabs doing? Nothing. They were scared. The settlers had weapons. Hey, stop. Stop. Get out of here. Go back to your homes. Uh, uh, hey, is that you? Hey, Come hey, here. Step up. He's just a kid. Hey, what is wrong with you, man? Look that way. He can't touch me. What is he doing? Yeah, I'm okay. Did he hurt you? Come on. So for the first hour or so, you, you protect them. You let them throw stones. You let them throw rocks for an hour and no one says anything? You don't understand. There was a lot of them and they were doing whatever they wanted. They had eight or nine vehicles backing them up. They had stopped traffic. Hey, no guns! Hey, 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 hey you can't do that! Back off, back off. Stay in your place, know your place. Did anyone get hurt? No one wants you here. Are you kidding? More than 10 Arabs got hit in the head. They were bleeding. You same settlers, by the way? There was another day they shot at the water tanks of the Arabs on top of their houses. Did the Arabs try to injure the settlers? No way. They poked their head out of a window. They get hit with a stone. Think about it. They're in shock. People live here. But they walk down the street, they get hit with stones. How did it end? It ended with us throwing the settlers out. That's enough. No. We decide what is enough. Not you. Can go do something else you can do? So these people are great. Get the fuck out of here! Oh, I'm reporting you. You guys better watch your place. Sure. Turn around and get back. They're the ones that you need to be. Go to hell! You never see it in the media. And that was another shock. Basically anything that goes on there. Innocent kids. 14 years old. Eight years old even die for no reason. Settlers break into their homes and, and shoot at them. Go crazy in the street and smash store windows. Set mosques on fire, throw eggs at soldiers. All of these things. They don't make it to the media. The settlers do whatever they want and the soldiers are forced to protect them. The settlers are the biggest Jewish Nazis I've ever met. And it's happening here in the, in the state of Israel, and, and no one knows about it. No one wants to know about it. And no one reports on it. I have to talk about something. About the settlers? No. It was in Bethlehem. Ah, oh, this is it. This is what you've been hiding. I was the photographer. I went out with the units, mostly at night, to document operations. They blew up houses of people suspected of being involved in terror. I think it was called change of address or something like that.
At first, it was people who carried out terrorist activity. Then it was, he's his uncle. Then, he's the brother of someone who knows him. All kinds of d distant connections like that. At the very beginning, it was done pretty much the same way. Mama. One clear, two clear, all clear. No, Leave my family no, alone. No. Turn around, up against the wall. If they were men, they were no. arrested. No, please, please, you haven't done anything. Please, for the love of God. You have 15 minutes, get all your belongings. 15 minutes and you have to leave the house. Get your things together, take your children, go quietly and nothing will happen. Where are we going? Hold on, take the computer. The document's on the house. Papa, don't go. Out, don't. now. Mama, where are we going? You have to be brave for your papa. Just be calm and do what I say. Take the computer. Shh, Mira, it's okay. Take this. Fill this with your clothes. Put on your jacket and your shoes. Where are they taking papa? You don't have much time. Just do what I say. You do. Take this. Fill this with your clothes. Put on your jacket and your shoes. Okay. Mama, where are we going? You think that I know? Stop asking questions. There was always a shin bed agent there with the forces, and someone from civil administration, and someone connected to the government who was responsible. There had to be explicit permission from the defense ministry by 3 or 3.30 a.m. Sometimes we'd evacuate the house 15 minutes beforehand. Depends on how nice the officer was. Sometimes five minutes, sometimes half an hour. During that time, soldiers from the Engineering Corps have already begun laying explosives in all kinds of places. Out, now, out! The documents! <laughs> the soldiers close in form a ring around the house, no. and the minute they get the okay, they demolish the house. <laughs> Afterwards, there's a final search to make sure there's nothing unusual. Then they evacuate the area within five minutes. Why did you take my father? Why do you come in the night? I can't sleep at night. You're just coming and coming and coming. That's how it is. Nothing you can do about it. That's what needs to be done. As time passed, after a few months, they stopped making calls to the legal advisor, or whoever it was. It became more and more frequent. And at a certain point, the okay wasn't needed anymore. They just came, set the explosives, blew up the house, and left.
things from that operation are always surfacing in my mind. Yes. It was only afterward, when I looked at the photos, that I saw the faces of the children and their mother, the looks in their eyes. It was the first time that I really saw them. We took away their home, and I thought to myself, how would I feel if someone did that to my family, to me? First, it, it doesn't matter what you do. You always come out okay. I could slap someone, hit them. I could shoot someone in the leg. I could, I could always say it was self-defense. I'm standing guard at a post, aiming my weapon at everyone. Do you know what image comes to mind for a Jewish soldier pointing a gun at a bunch of civilians? When you interfere in people's lives like that. And you're in control, and you can decide when he eats and when he does whatever. He slowly loses his worth. They're dolls. That moment was the turning point of my thinking. Afterwards, you can choose to go on ignoring it, or think about it more deeply, get into it, look at it from different perspectives and how you want to go on with your life in view of that. What has stuck with me the most is this feeling that I only got in hindsight, that I was a part of a machine that spread a lot of devastation and fear. I. I was such a racist there. People prefer not to know, not to understand that something terrible is happening there. Really? No one cares. And you, Elon, Sarah, Afram, what are you going to do now?